Session 5. The Diamond Dogs. The group nervously looks around, desperately hoping not to see any more bandits on the near horizon, and after a few moments, determine that they are truly alone, except for their new prisoner, Guy, the bandit captain who is the last survivor of the skirmish they just had. The party discusses quickly and decides that relocating is likely their best course of action. They pile the bodies on the fire and let them burn, grab Guy, and continue traveling for a short distance. Eventually they find a new campsite, and the party beds down once more to finish their rest. Fenwick takes the last moments of his charm person spell to converse with Guy and try and get any other information he can out of him. He determines that Guy has been pretty forthcoming and has shared most of what he knows about the agents of the Upside Down with him. He then heads back to camp and alerts Mardigan, who also desires a deeper conversation with Guy. After a short conversation, Mardigan decides to let him go, believing that Guy truly desires a fresh start and a clean break with the agents of the Upside Down. Just one thing, he says. If you ever see me again, cross the street. <laughs> Will do, Guy responds. The next day they awake and continue their travels to the town of Aviro, a small pit stop on their way to Kursburg, their final destination. But a few hours away from the town, they overhear something, singing, and detour off the footpath to the glade they've discovered down the hill. Mardigan, sneaking forward, is the first to see the green-skinned woman, her hair the leaves of a springtime maple, cascading down her body, creating a makeshift dress, whose arm is aloft and extended, a finger reaching towards the nearby birds and singing to them. Unsure of what to make of this alien creature, Mardigan draws his bow. But as he does, Eros, Fenwick, Rek, and Kethed have drawn closer and alerted the Dryad to their presence. She stops singing and scrambles for cover, and Eros and Fenwick approach cautiously. She is speaking a language that Eros has never heard before, but Fenwick knows well. That of Sylvan, the language of fey beings, which is the language Elven is derived from. Fenwick begins to interpret, and it is very apparent that after only a few moments, Eros has caught this dryad's attention. She resumes her singing from a safe spot, and Eros pulls a flute out to join. The birds join in once more, and Kethed, desiring to keep Rek from escalating the situation, pulls a flute of his own and hands it over to him. He tells Rek that he should go and play in the distance. It is around the time that the birds join in that Rek has started playing, and believes this to be his own doing. Back to the green-skinned woman, Eros is giving the performance of his life, and she smiles at him. After the fact, she approaches him and asks him to close his eyes. He obliges, and but mere moments later, she asks him to open them. And there in front of him is a beautiful flower. A marigold, but multicolored, bright purples, oranges, and even gold itself, shimmering in the spring sun, and a red pulsing glow coming from the ovule of the flower. She speaks, and Fenwick translates. She wants you to smell it. Eros obliges, and takes in the scent of teas being brewed, of honey and steam, comfort and laughter, soft music and whimsy, memories that are dear to him. He closes his eyes and embraces the moment of memories. And as he does, the dryad departs, fleeing quickly, and Mardigan lowers his bow. The group reconvenes and makes for Aviro, and once there they head towards the inn, called the Slathered Slob, which is owned by one Grandma Cecilia, and turns out to be a front for the agents of the Upside Down, a safe haven for the agents as it were. Mardigan applies his new amulet to feign a connection with the agents of the Upside Down, and in doing so is successful in securing both lodging and information for the group. The information comes mostly through a game of cards that evening over supper, where Mardigan learns a great many things about the city of Kurzburg, including contacts, locations of interest, and potential dangers for a rogue such as himself. He secures yet one more deal with Grandma Cecilia, who has been cautious, but has decided to take care of them. Mardigan prepares a letter for an old contact by the name of Quinn, and hands it over to Grandma Cecilia to be mailed for him, to which she agrees. Fenwick, too, tries to curry favor, feigning an amulet of his own, but fails to win over Grandma Cecilia very well. And that night over supper, Eros makes some coin performing for the crowd. The group, mostly waiting for Mardigan to finish his game of cards, eventually reconvenes once again, and head to their suite for the evening's rest. It is in their safe room that Mardigan shares more of his past, and his plans for the future, most of which revolving around the knife that he's carried with him for so long. This knife was a gift for my best friend. With your help, I hope to one day give it back to him. Kethed is able to connect with much of Mardigan's story, 
and the two form a deeper bond. The group, now finding even more common cause and a shared vision and purpose, recall the day prior and Kethid's mention of the Diamonds of Agreement. Mardigan suggests that they form a party officially and offers up the name the Diamond Dogs as one they can take for themselves. The group discusses and eventually agrees. The Diamond Dogs, it is. After heading to bed, Mardigan has a dream of a woman. Her panicked eyes wide with terror, rapid pulse and heavy breathing, her eyes locked on his, a fleeting whisper. Marty? And Mardigan awakes to the sound of thuds just outside their bedroom suite. Hey everybody, Spartan Bodhi here. And yes, this was another one of my favorite sessions. Holy smokes, a lot of it was role play. In fact, there was not a combat encounter this session. And sometimes those end up being some of my favorite sessions. A lot of this was role play, I already said that. And Mardigan was pretty much the star, which is kind of what you expect when you're dealing with the Thieves Guild as a rogue, and my player played it perfectly. As part of session zero, when we were setting up all of our character stuff, I ended up sending that document that I referred to in the last episode. That's the Dale Kingsmill Thieves Cant options, or rules or suggestions, I guess is really what they are, and he ate it up. Now, he didn't have to memorize them. I had sent him the document, so he was able to print them out and have them at his own disposal when it came time to actually bring them into play. And yes, we went through the card game, which I sped up for the sake of time in the episode recap, but we gave a lot of information from a rogue's perspective about the city of Kurzburg that will end up being pretty helpful and really vital to Mardigan's understanding of what's safe and what's potentially lucrative about the city. That is, if he's looking to uh, pill for any goods. This is also the session that my players decided to name themselves. Now, not every group that I've had has named themselves, but the vast majority of them have. It's kind of nice, you know, like a calling card. Something that rolls right off the tongue that you can say, oh, when you're either being arrested or taking on a job. Both have happened. But the Diamond Dogs are sure to be a lot of fun. Now, there were certainly some twists that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Yet again, another fantastic role to get the Dryad encounter on the travel table, as well as Fenwick trying to pretend to be an agent, uh, and that, that went rather hilariously wrong. Can't win them all, buddy, but I'm really glad you tried. Now, one of the best things moving forward, I think, is how the group has finally uh, some cohesion as to what it is they're trying to accomplish and ultimately why they've banded together. Revenge is a powerful motivator. It's not the best, but it's powerful. In my experience, most players that have some sort of tragic backstory end up using revenge as their primary motivation for whatever it is that ultimately they seek to accomplish with their character over a campaign. Now, without spoiling any of my intentions, I will say this, a good DM will know how to throw a twist into it all. So be ready for more of that as Mardigan's story unveils, as well as Kethed's and Fenwick's, all of whom have shown some quick expressed interest in Mardigan. I like that Eros has kept it kind of aloof at this point. Rek is pretty much just along for the ride, but Eros has a lot of plates spinning at the moment, and that's gonna be fun to discover in the sessions to come. So, that being said, whew, that session was a lot of work and it was so much fun. That's the session recap. So what do you think? Who's your favorite character so far? What story arc are you excited for? Do any of these characters remind you of a character that you've played or one that you're DMing for? Drop all that in the comments below. Otherwise, it's really good to see you, friend, and I'm really glad that you're here on this wonderful Tuesday or whatever day of the week you might be watching this on. It goes live on Tuesday. Every Tuesday, in fact. And if this was enjoyable to you, would you mind considering hitting that like and subscribe button? Every sub helps, and we're getting closer to our goal of 100. So please, join our community. In fact, our community has a Discord server. I'm about to sneeze. And we would love for you to join us there as well. The invite link to that will also be down in the blah blah below, as well as my handles on social media, both Instagram and Twitter, in case you wish to connect with me there. Friend, thank you for joining us. This wouldn't be possible without you. So, my hat's literally off to you. And in the meantime, adventure's calling. Are you listening? <laughs>